Today's topic is one of the most sobering and significant issues facing Christians of all nations. What role, if any, will the United States of America play in the final chapter of human history? Is America identified and included in the Bible account of end time prophetic events? We all know there was a time when Rome ruled the world. The Roman military legions defeated every army on earth and conquered every kingdom. Finally, the Roman Empire ruled absolute and unchallenged. But Rome's power produced wickedness and a lifestyle corrupt beyond belief. Drunkenness and gluttony and immorality, too depraved to describe, began to eat away at her strength and might. The empire declined as rapidly as it had grown until finally its own moral rottenness caused it to crumble and collapse on the ash heap of history. In our day, the United States has been the greatest, most powerful nation the world has ever known. But she is slipping. Are there parallels between Rome's sad history and story and what is happening to America today? Is she in an irreversible decline? Is her fall certain? My husband is regarded as a foremost authority on Bible prophecy. He has spent literally hundreds of hours of research and study on end time events. And so today he's going to report to us what he has learned about America in prophecy, the decline and fall of the American empire. Now, here's Dr. Jack Van Impey. Jack? Thank you, Excella. I love America, one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth. America has always been a bulwark of liberty and freedom for all, and I pray that this may always be true in my homeland. My parents left Belgium for the land of the free and the home of the brave in 1929, the year of the Great Depression. During the next 48 months, they experienced extreme deprivation and heartache, eking out a mere existence. Nevertheless, America, even in her worst hour of economic crisis, allowed Oscar and Louise Van Impey to enjoy a higher standard of living they had, than they had ever known in Europe. Mom and Dad speak with great pride of the glorious day when they became naturalized citizens of the United States of America. The experience has lived in their memories for a lifetime. As their son, I continually thank God for having been born in the land of their dreams. Yes, the Van Impey family honestly, sincerely, loudly, and dogmatically wants the world to know that we love America. Our feelings can best be expressed by quoting a portion of an editorial which appeared in an issue of Christianity Today. I am an American, and I'm patriotic. I'm not a blind patriot, for I'm an evangelical whose patriotism is formed by the Bible and tempered by biblical realism. When I fly over New York Harbor, I scan the horizon for the Lady of Liberty. Tears roll down my cheeks, and a lump rises in my throat. Without apology, I salute the flag and pledge my allegiance to my country. I identify with Nathan Hale and regret that I have only one life to give for my country. I pay my taxes and vote at almost every opportunity. I want to be a good citizen and a loyal American for Jesus' sake. I love America, and I'm thankful for this country. Thankful for what? I'm thankful that I live in a land where pilgrim fathers first set foot on these shores in search of freedom to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience, where founding fathers believed that human freedom was worth fighting for, where statesmen first formed a union to preserve those liberties and recognize that all true and legitimate governments are constituted for the welfare of the people. Where citizens valued education and dotted this land with schools from kindergarten to university. Where leaders risked the existence of the Union to extend its liberty to all races and where courts have gradually implemented these rights to make the law a reality. Where women are not slaves but are honored and protected as persons to whom all rights as full persons must be granted. 
where we are free to worship God as we choose, where we imprint in God we trust on our coins, appoint chaplains, and pray for our congressmen, where educational opportunities are available to all and higher education to most, where we can vote out of office those who stand for what we deem wrong, where policemen are generally our defenders and who consider it their main duty to protect us. I am an American and proud of my country. I love my country. But because I love it, I seek to improve it. And to improve it, I must judge it. But to weigh and to judge and to seek to improve are not incompatible with patriotism and love of country. Rather, they are expressions of highest love, informed, intelligent, sacrificial love, biblical love, that is. And so, as a biblically informed patriot, I love America. In this context, I share the following information. Why has God so blessed America? I believe the answer is that this nation has been basically good under God. In Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28, God says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known. For decades, pulpits thundered the truth of this text, making and keeping America one nation under God. This is what Alexis de Tocqueville witnessed as he traveled throughout our nation. He said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system and her institutions of learning. It wasn't there. It was not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness that I understood the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Yes. Our greatness came into being because our foundations and roots were anchored in God and the Holy Bible. For example, the Mayflower Compact signed November 11th, 1620, began in the name of God, we whose names are underwritten, have undertaken for the glory of God the advancement of the Christian faith. Again, the final sentence of the Declaration of Independence contains a declaration of dependence upon Almighty God. America's educational system used the McGuffey Reader for nearly 100 years. This series was loaded with the Word of God. In fact, one story in every four was a biblical narration. Some of the lessons with religious instructions were the hour of prayer, religion, the only basis for society, control your temper, the Bible, the best of classics, the baptism, the folly of intoxication, and beware of the first drink. Today, through the influence of one loud-mouthed atheist, the Bible has been virtually eliminated from the curriculum of the American educational system. The result? Righteousness has been replaced by debasing and debauching trash, and God has been replaced by secular humanism. By replacing righteousness with trash and God with secular humanism, the predicted results are becoming evident. The Detroit News recently reported that 10 public schools here in my city are near a state of anarchy. Los Angeles and every major city reports the same chaotic mess. Let me tell you why. When revolutionaries with PhD degrees teach revolution, revolutionary anarchists are created. Just look at the mess humanistic educators have spawned since God has been dethroned in America. Our nation has never been in such a state of degradation. 
and hopelessness. Truly, America is laden with iniquity. The pollution inundating the land centers around one, drunkenness, culturally identified as alcoholism. Ten million inebriates drink themselves into insensibility on a continual basis, while millions more spend billions on booze annually. Two, drug addiction, which mars and scars another 10 million in our nation. Three, tobacco, which pollutes both lungs and land to the tune of 10 billion per year. Four, gambling, which robs needy millions through governmentally controlled lotteries and mafia-dominated casinos in the amount of 60 billion each year. Five, prostitution and primping, which spreads disease and shame to 9 million Americans every 12 months and costs 25 to $100 per act. Six, homosexuality, which seeks to arrogantly, egotistically, blatantly, and publicly boast about its perverted ways. Seven, smut peddling, which spreads sexual filth via magazine racks throughout the nation. This satanically inspired garbage is found everywhere, including the corner grocery store. Christians should rise up in arms, boycott establishments loaded with soul-destroying adulterous materials, and patronize the businesses of decent Americans. Eight, immoral liberals also plague the nation. As a result, millions are carrying illegitimate babies. Thousands of the victims are 11 to 13 years of age. It appears that high school sex education courses have stimulated rather than educated our children. Young man, young woman, mom and dad, beware. They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Job 4, 8. Remember, VD is rampant. One out of five Americans have some form of it. And the worst form, AIDS, will kill you. Nine, abortion. The murder of unwanted babies produced by the immoral lepers has reached epidemic proportions, claiming 20 to 25 million innocent lives since 1973. God, forgive us. Forgive us. 10. Euthanasia or mercy killing is also being openly advocated. In fact, doctors Watson and Crick, the famous Nobel Prize-winning discoverers of the DNA molecule, have both recommended the practice. Dr. Crick advocates compulsory death for all at the age of 80. This is the ultimate deed of a depraved society created by human beings who have decided to play God. Surely, shades of Hitlerism abound. Leaven, murder. This age-old sin, born of a wanton disrespect for human life, currently stalks every area of the country, claiming 50,000 victims annually. Twelve, robbing and looting inundates America on a daily basis, as one segment of society plunders and pillages the lifetime accumulations of others. No nation can continue indefinitely under such sinful circumstances. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14, 34. Sin can only produce disaster, both for individuals and nations alike. This is why Psalm 917 declares, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God God never allows individuals or nations to get away with sin indefinitely because the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 Consider Sodom. This nation was filled with sex perverts who wanted to rape angels because they appeared as men, Genesis 19.5, and God hates this sin. Romans 1, verses 26-32 Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50 proclaim additional abominations 
that brought God's judgment upon the transgressors of Sodom. I quote, Behold, this was the iniquity of Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and an abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me, saith God. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Listen, this passage is very clear as to what the sins of Sodom were. <laughs> when I first read this passage of Scripture, I could see America to the letter. America, land of the proud. America, a land full of bread. America, a land of leisure and an abundance of idleness. America, a land of greed. America, a haughty nation. America, a land honoring sexual perversion. America, proud and proud to be proud. But remember, pride goeth before destruction. And in a haughty spirit before a fall, Proverbs 16, 18. Consider also the fall and decline of the mighty Roman Empire. Philip Myers, in Rome, its rise and fall, made this observation about the Romans. Almost from the beginning, the Roman stage was gross and immorality abounded. So absorbed did the people become in the indecent representations of the stage that they lost all thought and care of the affairs of real life. Hey. Have you noticed the magazines on the corner newsstand? They overflow with perversion, pornography, and violence. Advertisements for plays or movies are also lewd and obscene. Newspapers that editorialize against pornography also run advertisements graphically portraying the subject matter they oppose. What hypocrisy! <laughs> Consistency, thou art a jewel. In his classic work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon listed among the causes of Rome's fall the mounting desire for pleasure and the brutalization of sports. He said, now get this, from morning to evening, regardless of sun or rain, the spectators who sometimes numbered 400,000 remained at eager attention. Why, the happiness of Rome seemed to hang on the event of a race. Today, spectator sports in America is a multi-million dollar business. One professional event overlaps another, and playoffs continue to proliferate and brutalization abounds. Samuel Dill, writing about Roman society in the last century of the Western Empire, said, Silvinius, assured us that Christians also indulge in the madness of the circus and the wantonness of the theater, while the arms of the vandals rang around the walls. It was feasting and playing, not fasting and praying. How like our day, Savinius added, the applause of the spectators also mingled with the groans of the dying and the battle cries of the attackers. This was Christianity during the days of Rome's glory. Prophetically, the scene will be similar when Christ is about to return. God, through the Apostle Paul, informed us that mankind will turn to physical pleasure in the face of judgment. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5 state, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, hey, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Listen to God, from such turn away. Believe me, folks, 
as Sodom and the Roman Empire declined and fell, so America may soon experience an unprecedented holocaust, decline, and fall. What's ahead for America? Through multitudinous illustrations, I'll endeavor to prove that America, the land I love, the land of which I'm a citizen, is on the descendancy and may soon suffer horrendous judgment. Does God's Word, the Bible, predict such calamities? Is America literally found in Bible prophecy? Let's look and see. Now, there are a number of chapters within the pages of God's Word that certainly seem to picture the USA. And I will not dogmatically say that the facts I'm about to present demand this conclusion. However, I will emphatically declare that no other nation throughout the pages of history can so convincingly fulfill all of the requirements of the prophesied text. Immediately, someone mentally argues, well, the USA is not mentioned by name in the Bible. Right. However, it is equally true that America must be included in texts prophesying that all nations suffer judgment in the last days. Micah 5.15 states, I will execute vengeance in anger and fury upon the nations, all of them, such as they've not heard. Again, Ezekiel 39.21 declares that all the nations shall see my judgment. America is certainly included in the blitzkrieg upon all nations. But, and furthermore, Ezekiel 38.13 mentions Tarshish and all our young lions coming to the defense of Israel for the world war that precedes, not is, but precedes Armageddon. Ah, who's Tarshish? According to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the name Tarshish is found 20 times in God's Word and always refers to the land farthest west of Israel, or namely, Great Britain. Notice that our text says, Merchants of Tarshish. For they traded goods around the world. When this portion of Scripture was written, there was only one way to trade goods. That was through ships. So do you remember the slogans of history? Britannia rules the waves, England, the mistress of the seas. The ancient Phoenicians and others got all of their tin from Tarshish. In fact, Britain means the land of tin. But notice again, our text says, Tarshish with all her young lions. The symbol on top of the American flag is the eagle, and the symbol on top of the English flag is the lion. Thus, Tarshish with all her young lions refers to the English-speaking nations of the world, including the United States and Canada. However, I believe we can pinpoint America further in this prophetical study. In doing so, we must move ahead to the study of characteristics and traits involving nations to see which country fulfills the prophetical predictions. When this is accomplished, the USA alone meets the requirements. God's Word mentions three Babylons, a city, Genesis 11, a church, Revelation 17, and a nation, Revelation 18. Please, don't confuse the three by intermingling these chapters. The context of each text identifies who's who to the careful student. I believe Isaiah, Jeremiah, and John graphically describe this nation. Who is she? Where is she? Let's begin with Isaiah chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. The prophet states, Woe to the land! shadowing with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, that sendeth ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes, upon the waters, saying, Go, ye swift messengers, to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden down, whose land the rivers have spoiled. 
The nation described in this text is in dire difficulty with God because the opening word is judgmental. God says, whoa. And the term always connotates judgment. Now, this nation, one, has the insignia of wings, similar to our national emblem, the bald eagle with its extended wings. I'm going to go slowly because this is deep. Two, it's a land that is beyond Ethiopia and the sea. Israel is always the focal point in the Bible, so the message of warning is directed to a far country beyond Ethiopia and across the sea from Israel. <laughs> this designation eliminates Europe, Asia, and Africa. Instead, it points to a nation with outstretched wings across the sea from Israel, and only, only America qualifies. Three, the nation is scattered and peeled. Scattered means widely spread out or having great land area. Four, she's measured. This certainly describes our beloved country with its counties, cities, and states. One's amazed as he traverses America by air and sees the staked out acres from the heavens, tens of thousands of miles, completely measured and marked. Russia is just the opposite of this description. Five, she is a land whose rivers are spoiled. Ecological experts vouch that this significant prophecy has definitely occurred to our waterways in our generation. Thus, Isaiah tells us that dreadful judgment will come upon a nation with outstretched wings beyond the seas of Israel, which has vast measured land areas and polluted waters. Jeremiah also pinpoints America's characteristics with even greater detail. In chapter 30, verse 11, God says, I will make a full end of all nations. It is evident that unprecedented judgment shall sweep the entire world, including America. However, the prophet singles out a specific nation for judgment. Now, who is this Babylon mentioned by the Holy Spirit in Jeremiah chapters 50 and 51? She is one, a nation who is destroyed by an assembly of nations from the north. This certainly was not fulfilled when the Medes and Persians from the east attacked ancient Babylon. Neither could these two small nations fulfill a Latter-day prophecy concerning an assembly of great nations moving against a final Babylon from the north. Thus the prophecy presently unfulfilled must be futuristic. Two, she has a mother who's sorely confounded. Jeremiah 50, verse 12. Again, we see that ancient Babylon had no mother, only a father and founder named Nimrod. But prophetical and futuristic Babylon has a mother who exists at the same time as Babylon, but in a confounded, deteriorated condition. Surely, Britain is this modern-day mother if America's in view. The shrinking of the English Empire and England's woes confirm that England, Mama, is confounded. Three, she is the youngest among the great world powers, for she is the hindermost of the nations, or last of the nations, to become internationally prominent. Jeremiah 50, verse 12. America celebrated its bicentennial July 4th, 1976. However, 200 years of age makes our country but a baby among the nations of earth, comparatively speaking. Four, she is an end time nation. For she exists when Israel is back in her land. Think of it. This is the most amazing text on the subject in the Bible. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 19 declares, I will bring Israel again to his habitation. 
This happened in 1948 when the Jews of the world returned to their homeland, hoisted their flag, the six-pointed Star of David, and named the nation Israel. What tremendous proof that God had an end-time Babylon in mind when Jeremiah penned the prophecies 25 centuries ago. Five, she is also a nation who has been proud against the Lord. This situation exists presently in America. The Supreme Court ruled Bible reading and prayer out of the educational system and constantly votes on the side of every hell-bent scheme. Judges set criminals free more quickly than police can apprehend them. Filthiness and irreverence also flood the land as pornography, obscenity, and depravity hold sway. And clergymen promote homosexuality, situation ethics, and the mockery of God's holy word. Surely haughtiness against God reigns in modern Babylon. Six, she is a nation of mingled people. Have we not been called the melting pot of the world? Millions have come from every nation and tongue to the land of milk and honey. My own Belgian parents were part of the immigration to America in 1929 and became part of the mingled multitude mentioned in Jeremiah 50, verse 37. Seven, this nation is declared wealthy, for Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. In fact, the nations who have tasted of her delicacies are mad, Jeremiah 51, 7. Even now, the third world nations whose income levels produce mass starvation have tasted of America's dainties via movies and television and are becoming insane in their quest to partake of America's goodies. Who but America could fulfill their dreams. Political Babylon could, for she is abundant in treasures. Jeremiah 51, 13. Eight, she is a nation that dwells upon many waters. Jeremiah 51, 13. This could not be ancient Babylon, a desert country. So must be a nation similar to ours bordered on each side by the world's largest oceans and having the mighty Mississippi. Nine, this nation, like ancient Babylon, tries to mount up to heaven. Jeremiah 51, 53. America has already arrived on the moon, sent spaceships to Mars, and become the preeminent leader in space technology. Certainly, the type is cast. The sign fulfilled, and the future calamitous. God sent the confusion of tongues to ancient Babylon because they tried to reach heaven without God and failed. And America will also pay a price for forsaking God. But there's more. John, in the book of Revelation, also gives us insight into modern Babylon. Chapter 17 deals with religious Babylon, while chapter 18 deals with political Babylon, undoubtedly the United States of America. What does John depict? One, a nation through whom the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies or luxuries, Revelation 18.3. Two, a nation laden with sins. Verse 5. 3. A nation which hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. Verse 7. That's us. We spend $173 billion annually for food, alcohol, tobacco, recreation, and gambling. This is living high on the hog. But neighbor, the present pleasure craze whirlwind will not last forever. America's destruction may soon come in jet speed fashion. We could indeed become the brutalized, battered, and beaten Babylon of the following texts. God says, For lo, I will raise into cause up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. 
Jeremiah 50, verse 9. Revelation 18, 10 pictures the kings of the earth who have lived scandalously in the arms of Babylon, weeping as her disintegrating smoke ascends heavenward, crying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. They continue in verses 16 to 19. Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls for one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she made desolate. Today, a devastating atomic attack could in one hour's time obliterate everything a nation took two centuries to build. If God has America in mind, and it certainly looks that way, then what? Are you prepared for the judgment that may soon hit our nation like a bolt of lightning? Have you anchored your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ? There is no other way to be saved and ready for the coming hour of woe. Trust Christ now if you already have it. Now, let's see what's coming and why. The British historian Arnold Toynbee stated that of the 21 civilizations that existed throughout world history, 19 fell through atheism, alcoholism, materialism, and socialism. The handwriting's on the wall, America. Our decline along these same lines may bring sudden destruction and I must sound the alarm. Ezekiel 3, 17 to 19 states, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Isaiah 58, 1 adds, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Oh, listen to me. Decline is already visible in America, as mentioned earlier in this tape, because we, like other civilizations, have allowed atheists, agnostics, skeptics, and weirdos to set our standards. PhDs told our college students that there was no creation by an almighty God. Instead, <laughs> a lot of monkey business took place. These irresponsible, irreligious God deniers never found the missing link of their evolutionary hypothesis and never, never scientifically proved their allegations. Nevertheless, an entire generation of brainwashed graduates listened and accepted their unverified theories. From this beginning, the schools eventually banned the creation story the Bible, and then God himself. What nonsensical pagans some mortals be. This degenerative process led to immorality, impropriety, and immobility as pagans experimented and died from drinks and drugs. Today, every conceivable act of vice and violence is the practice of the hour, the result of atheistic influence through the educational system and entertainment media. The result, our nation has been defiled morally. 
Today, Americans spend approximately $31 billion per year for alcoholic beverages. This amounts to $3.5 million per hour. The disease has reached epidemic proportions, and child alcoholism is part of the menace. The federal government's National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism states, by the time students reach the 12th grade, think of it, 50% drink regularly, and 25% have been drunk. Millions more are drug addicts, and millions more have one-night stands or live-ins without a marriage license. Such sins destroy a nation and send unrepentant addicts and drunkards to a godless eternity. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10 state, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, premarital sex, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, extramarital sex, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, homosexual acts, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 lists 17 sins. Number 16 is drunkenness. After naming these practiced abominations, including drunkenness, the Bible says, hear it, they which do such things shall shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God wrote it. I only quote it. Concerning drugs, the Bible declares in Revelation 21, 8 that the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murders and whoremongers and circle it, sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The term sorcerer is an English transliteration from the Greek pharmakia and means pharmacy or drugstore. The original idea is to use drugs for a high, a lift, or a kick, not a medication. God plainly states that those who use drugs promiscuously will be in the lake of fire. The defilement extends into the sexual area as well. Dr. Murray Kappelman states, the sex revolution is over and sex is won. Sexual experimentation is now occurring at 13 and 14 years of age. The pressure from the peer group and the media to be sexually active is enormous. Today, if a girl is a virgin at 17, she is made to feel she's in need of therapy, just the opposite of 20 years ago. Dr. Kappelman indicts the media for much of this immorality. Is there any validity to his claim? Let's see. Filthy brainwashing is having its effect. It contributes to sexual intercourse on the part of 35% of the girls in the nation who are 15 to 19 years of age, according to Patricia McCormick in the United Press International release. Surely, this makes 1,300,000 sinners who shack up without a marriage license in our nation feel comfortable in their adulterous condition. After all, if the heroes of the silver screen can do it and make it look decent, why not try it? The problem is that God, yea, the God of holiness, is still against any act of sex that takes place outside of the bonds of holy matrimony. If one does not have a marriage license and plays sex games, he will end up eternally, eternally lost. God's holy commandment in Exodus 20, 14 states, Thou shalt not commit adultery. What makes one think he can flaunt God's rules and not end up in eternal bliss? Just who do we think we are? Say, God is no respecter of persons, Romans 2.11, and one day God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, Romans 2.16. 
then our brazen disregard of God's laws will be judged. God's law declares marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled in marriage. But whoremongers and adulterers, the swingers and the one-night flingers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. Revelation 22, 15 declares, For without heaven are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, woman chasers and men seducers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Can America sink any lower in the mud of depravity? Wicked, satanically controlled purveyors of smut, the publishers, printers, and sellers of pornography are the guilty culprits behind this filth. However, the educational system of the United States also shares some of the blame for the deteriorated debacle in which the nation finds itself. A 13-year-old girl in Austin, Texas, came home in a distraught condition because a sex education film entitled All About Sex had been shown in her home economics class. It showed a nude couple in the actual act. A magazine depicting sex and condom use just arrived in my office from Hawaii. It's used with fifth graders. Certainly, America needs an investigation into the morals of its teaching staff. Many of them bring their barnyard manners into the classroom and present them as rationally acceptable. Now, since the intellectually elite accept some depravity, no question should therefore be asked. The problem is that a corrupt mind, educated or uneducated, is still rotten to the core. God says their mind and conscience is defiled. Titus 1.15. This deterioration of standards has led to 20 million abortions. Think of it. The brainwashed victims, monkey see, monkey do, whom instructors with evolutionary monkey tendencies indoctrinated, now do what monkeys would never do. Kill their babies. Where will it end? The next step, undoubtedly, is related to Nazism. Why? Because Hitler murdered millions. Hitler believed in genocide and practiced it. Babies and adults with physical blemishes were liquidated. Likewise, educated morons are now advocating mercy killing as the next step in America's de filing decline. Dr. Francis Crick, Nobel Prize winner, advocates newborn babies should not be considered alive until they're two days old and have been certified as healthy by medical examiners. He also advocates compulsory death for all at age 80. Dr. Gallup said, if a doctor takes money for killing an innocent babe in the womb, he will kill you with a needle when paid by your children. This, he said, is the terrible nightmare we're creating for the future. How long will God's patience last? Can America survive in the midst of such wickedness? Jeremiah predicted that swift judgment would come at such a time. What and where are his prophecies? In chapter 50, verse 9, an assembly of great nations or superpowers come up against Babylon from the north country. Remember, I already said it, Russia is north of the USA. When the attack begins, the advancing enemy's arrows are shot with reliable accuracy. This probably pictures an onslaught of missiles which Russia has perfected. The sneak attack which catches Babylon or America unaware, verse 24, cuts asunder 
and breaks the nation, described as the hammer of the earth. Verse 23. Is America symbolized by a hammer? A hammer shapes and creates. Blacksmiths have been famous for their creation with hammers, and America has created and shaped foreign policy for years. Now, this sneak attack against the hammer of the earth is devastating because the archers or missile loaders are called together against Babylon to knock her from her haughty pedestal and punish her for turning her back on the Lord. Verse 29, all this takes place through a nuclear holocaust, for God continues, and the most proud shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. And I will kindle a fire, atomic warfare in his cities, and it shall devour all round about him. Verse 32. Furthermore, a sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled, there it is again, or ethnic people that are in the midst of her. Verse 37. Here's why. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof for pride, fullness of bread, idleness, laziness, unconcern for the poor, and homosexuality, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, they, the Russians, shall hold the bow and lance, they're cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. Verses 40 to 42. At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth is moved and the cry is heard among the nations. Verse 46. Chapter 51 continues. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her. Take balm for her pain. Verse 8. One of the reasons for this nation's fall lies in the fact that draft dodgers, remember Vietnam, have resisted the call to serve. Yes, the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. They've remained in their holes. Their might hath failed. They became as women, verse 30. Another reason lies in the fact that terroristic saboteurs cause internal havoc in the nation. Verse 32 declares, the passages are stopped and the men of war, military leaders are affrighted, are scared to death. Passages may mean communication lines and stopped is self-explanatory. The traitorous Judases seize the lines of communication and stop all television, telegraph, and telephone releases. Radio 2 is cut off. New York City's past power failures give one a descriptive picture of what follows in the wake of sabotage. America is ripe for such terrorism. Despite all that patriots try to do, it appears that a hopeless situation confronts America. Judgment comes upon all nations, Jeremiah 30, 11, and Babylon does not escape this infamous international conflict. Though she builds a spectacular space program and mounts up to heaven, and though she fortifies the height of her strength by creating utterly fantastic atomic-laden space vehicles, verse 53, still the broad walls of Babylon are utterly broken, and her high gates are burned with fire, verse 58. Finally, John, the New Testament expositor of Babylonian destruction, pictures the scene as follows. God is angry with Babylon, whose sins have reached unto heaven. And he remembers her iniquities, Revelation 18.5. Now Babylon must reap what she has sown, and her plagues come in one day upon leaders and statesmen who have committed ungodly acts with her and lived deliciously off of her unlimited wealth. They bewail her and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning, verse 9, and cry, alas, alas, that great city of Babylon, that mighty city. 
for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth, the world's stockbrokers, bankers, and salesmen shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen, verses 10 to 12. Instead, new clear blasts and the covetous grasping for goods in one hour. Yes, in one hour so great riches is come to naught or nothingness. Verse 17. No wonder the Savior said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Matthew 6.20 There one's accumulated wealth through giving abides forever in the form of souls one to Christ. Now, here is some comforting news in closing. Thank God the saved will not be present to cry with earth's multitudes when they cast dust on their heads saying, alas, alas, that great city, for in one hour is she made desolate, verse 19. However, if one is unsaved, he or she will be included in the coming judgment. Dear friend, soon everything you possess, your little empire, may crumble in one hour of time. Then what? Will you perish in the catastrophic judgment of this prophesied time? Or will you have been taken at Christ's return? Because true believers are called up in Revelation 4.1 when he says, Come up hither, and the burning of Babylon takes place 14 chapters later. Are you ready for the great escape? The coming of the Lord for his born-again children? One's only hope is found in receiving Christ. For this makes one a son or a daughter of God. John 1.12 Receive him now before Babylon burns. And here's how you can do that. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died for your sins. Who his own self bear? our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 Peter 2, 24. And that day as he died, Calvary's cross, he shed his blood for you. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, Hebrews 9, 22. And when one comes to the cross and in his mind's eye sees Jesus hanging there, dying, bleeding, and realizes that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. And then says, Lord Jesus, wash me in your blood. Cleanse me. I repent of my sin. I turn from my past wickedness. I want to live for you. I want to be ready. The moment he says, I believe and I receive you, Jesus, that moment, one is instantaneously saved. Will you do it right now? Look at me and pray this in closing. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I'm tired of my sin. I repent of my sin. I change my mind about the way I've been living. I thank you for Calvary and your shed blood. Cleanse me now from all my past sin in that blood. I receive you now as my personal Savior. Come into my heart. Save me now. In your holy name, I pray this, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, write to this ministry. And we'll send you a free booklet entitled, First Steps in a New Direction, 
which will help you in your new walk as a Christian.